Comrades, 50 minutes for a, a question like why the U.S. is headed for a revolution and uh, what the meaning of a capitalist impasse is in our epoch. It's a, it's a pretty tricky task, and I'm going to do my best to do it a bit of justice in the time that I have. And I think that it's a question about mass consciousness. It's a question about what are the factors in history that are shaping the thinking of millions of people around the world. Because if we're going to have a revolution, if we're going to overthrow this system on a global scale, it requires a synchronizing of the way that people are thinking about what capitalism represents, what it represents historically, about its exhaustion historically, about what it represents for humanity. And we are firmly convinced that all of the historical factors necessary to bring humanity to that conclusion, they're, un they're underway. They're working today. I think the context for this is what's happened in the last six years or so in the United States political landscape. It's been a complete transformation, almost something you wouldn't recognize if you think about the attitudes of people toward society, toward capitalism, where society is headed, particularly the attitudes in uh, public opinion towards terms like socialism and capitalism. In the year leading up to the 2016 election, the word socialism was the single most searched word on Merriam-Webster online. That's one indication. Here are some of the headlines from the six years since. See if you can pick up on a common news item that uh, a lot of the media was picking up on. The Guardian. Why are there suddenly millions of socialists in America? Newsweek. Why is socialism suddenly so popular? New York Magazine. When did everyone become a socialist? The New Yorker. Why socialism is back? The Nation. Why millennials aren't afraid of socialism? Washington Post. The socialist youth. Why millennials are embracing a bad old term. Bloomberg, get rid of capitalism? Millennials are ready to talk about it. Cato Institute, why so many millennials are socialists and what we can do about it? <laughs> the Independent, more than a third of millennials approve of communism. NY Post, NY Post, communism is trendier than Louis Vuitton for Gen Z Americans. <laughs> And Teen Vogue, class solidarity is our only hope for survival. Yeah. You know, many of these articles, they talk about the same things. They're looking for indicators of the shifting mood, and it's not hard to find them. I mean, a lot of them, they talk about the popularity of Sanders, particularly among young people, the rise of self-described socialists in office, like AOC, growing membership of socialist organizations like DSA, organizations far to the left of DSA as well. And aside from the headlines, you know, the best indicator, you want to find the best indicator of what's happening in public opinion, the best way is to ask. Ask young people. The polls say everything. And I love these polls, these annual polls that have been sponsored by Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. <laughs> from 2017, 2018, 19, 20, every time these polls come out, you see millions more young people are turning their back on, commun on capitalism. Millions more young people are opening up not just the socialism, this is not just like the Sanders moment. It's not the vague socialism that you get from, from DSA and other outlets on the, uh, on the left. They're turning to communism, to Marxism, openness to ideas like public ownership of the means of production. You know, I think that they may have realized that this, these polls were just extremely encouraging for the communists, and so maybe that's why they stopped publishing them in 2020. But the latest figures indicated the following breakdown numerically. This is just among Gen Z and millennials put together. 34 million young people view communism favorably in the United States. 39 million view Marxism favorably in this country after so many decades of, of propaganda. 45 million support the elimination of capitalism. 65 million view socialism favorably. So when you have these kinds of figures, you know, it's, the question is, what is the goal of the movement? You have something surging into the political landscape. What do these young people want to achieve? And along with this surge of polls, of, of political currents, you've had the rise of left-wing media, of magazines, of podcasts, reading groups, YouTubes, YouTubers, blogs, hundreds of book titles. The rise of a strategic debate about what is it we're after? What is it that we're trying to achieve? What does it mean to fight for socialism? And that's a, a strategic debate that we're very interested in, in the IMT. A few years ago, the Washington Post published an interesting article. It's by a historian, Andrew Hartman. It's called The Millennial Left's War Against Liberalism. And it says, 
The millennial left is not a return to the new left of the 1960s, the student radicals and hippies who raised hells in their efforts to end the Vietnam War and change American culture. Rather, it invokes the ideas of the old left of the 1930s, the militant labor unions, socialists, and even communists, who in the context of the worst economic depression in American history sought a genuine alternative to capitalism. That's what I think this new current of radicalization represents. It's, not, it's nothing we've seen in, since the, the Second World War. It's a striving for a genuine alternative to capitalism. It goes on to say, in the 1930s, hundreds of thousands of workers joined the mass labor unions of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. Even the Communist Party, always suspect in American political life, enjoyed a surge in its American ranks thanks to the relatively common view that the Great Depression sounded the death knell of capitalism. Think of that political environment, what it gives rise to among widespread layers. So as revolutionary Marxists who defend revolutionary socialism in this debate, one of the basic messages that our comrades are putting forward systematically across the US, across the world, is that yes, we live in a revolutionary epoch today. Our goal is the overthrow of capitalism. And yes, we're absolutely convinced that there's a possibility of achieving this in our lifetime. That's the kind of epoch that we live in. But I want to start by acknowledging that that's not the dominant view on the left, and it hasn't been since the post-war era. If you want to look at the dominant view, the currents that have been speaking as the representatives of this new left-wing trend, the, the views behind the books that are being published at Verso and Haymarket, the leading currents within DSA and its strategy, above all publications like Jacobin. Jacobin recently celebrated its 10-year anniversary with a, an editorial it talks about having become a major voice on the global left, and it claims that the magazine has made the most significant contribution toward creating an intellectual space of debate for socialist and progressive intelligentsia of our time, <laughs> mostly by drawing on the academic world. They say, Jacobin has become a magnet for the left's strongest thinkers. By its gravitational pull, Jacobin has managed to attract those scattered socialists among the professional classes who otherwise would have been absorbed by the university system. <laughs> so it is very exciting. We want to hear the advice of the left's strongest thinkers, um, that what they have to offer the growing socialist movement. One of these authors uh, wrote a book uh, a couple years ago. It was published called How to Be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century. It's by a University of Wisconsin professor. The following advice, give up the fantasy of smashing capitalism. <laughs> capitalism is not smashable. In one way or another, you have to deal with capitalist structures and institutions. Taming and eroding capitalism are the only viable options. So apparently that's the anti-capitalism of the 21st century, not like the old fashioned anti-capitalism where you try to overthrow the system. It's the one where you accept capitalism, figure out ways to tame and erode it. That's lesson one. Another title, The New Communists. It's all about what's new. It's the new era, referring to the fact that interest in communism itself is rising in this country. Here's what it has to say. Just a few different quotes from the article. Today, 100 years after the Russian Revolution, the world has turned. The world's working classes have moved on. Today, the probability of such a revolution is infinitesimally small. What haunts the socialists left today is our inability to move on from these dreams of apocalyptic rupture fantasies of new, unfathomable worlds. You got to move on. Another editorial. This is the final, uh, the final one I'll, I'll treat you to. This is Our Road to Power, an editorial by Vivek Chibber, who also teaches at NYU. He's presented as kind of like a left uh, celebrity in the media. He goes on, you know, New York Times podcast, and he's the one, the rep he's the, the Bolshevik, you know, the one representing the, the radical. Here's what he has to say about the Bolshevik Revolution, by the way. There is no doubt that the decades from the early 20th century all the way to the Spanish Civil War could be described as a revolutionary period. It was an era in which the possibility of a, of a ruptural break with capitalism could be seriously contemplated, and a strategy could be built around it. But starting in the 1950s, openings for this kind of strategy narrowed. And today, it seems entirely hallucinatory to think about socialism through this lens. These are the views of the dominant current on the left, the public uh, spokespeople of the rising uh, left current, the ones that are speaking for the movement. And it has been the dominant view for, for decades, this idea that we don't live in an era of revolution anymore. The idea of overthrowing capitalism, you're in a dream world if that's the goal that you're setting for yourself. You need to move on. If you move outside of this space, this 
you know, progressive intelligence, if you move outside of the, uh, the university offices of these professors and you look at what's happening around the world in country after country, mass uprisings that have brought down governments in every corner of the globe, rebellions, full-blown revolutions. In 2019, there were mass uprisings in a quarter of the countries on earth. We have comrades here from Puerto Rico, where one-sixth of the population poured into the streets and brought down the government of Ricky Rosselló in 2019 through mass demonstrations and strike action. Three years ago this month, you had the October rebellion sweeping through Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, country after country. These are not just demonstrations. It wasn't just general strikes. You had the rise of elements of dual power, armed bodies of workers' defense, arresting military personnel, disarming the police, erecting barricades and checkpoints, seizing control of all major highways, setting up revolutionary assemblies, not just for discussion, for making decisions and carrying them out. These are the scenes that have sprung up around the world. In Algeria, three million people flooded the streets in a revolution that brought down the 20-year dictatorship of Bouteflika. In Sudan, talk about a, a classical proletarian revolution. You had the masses organized in a general strike that had 100% participation of the working class. Even all government, not only did the workers organize themselves and take over industry, all government, all government ministries, the workers organized themselves into councils and declared their allegiance to the revolution. You had power in the hands of, of the working class. Basically, all administrative day-to-day -day is, is going into the hands of the working class. This is revolutions that are happening in our period. That brought down the 30-year dictatorship of al-Bashir. You know, the serious analysts are not the professors that are talking about living in a post-revolutionary era. It's the ones that are warning the ruling class that this is a revolutionary era, that there's a threat of revolution everywhere. Compare these uh, earlier quotes we heard to comments from Paolo Gerbaudo, a political sociologist at King's College in London. He says, these protests are popular insurgencies. They reflect the failure of nation states in the global era. They're not a passing crisis that can be remedied through the regular levers of the state. These movements may be the early symptoms of a new global crisis. They're like seismographs. They're like the dials that announce things that are coming on the horizon. That's a much more perceptive analysis than anything that you'll read in Jacobin. And in the, in the years since 2019, it's been a continuation of this process. We had mass uprisings in Kazakhstan, in Myanmar, in Sri Lanka, the second wave of the Sudanese revolution. Now you have these revolutionary developments in Iran, as comrades have said, the largest uprising since the 1979 revolution. And it would be one thing you know, to dismiss these kinds of developments if they were only happening in faraway places and if they were never covered on the news, which they often get very little coverage. But the U.S., comrades, the U.S. lived through its largest mass movement in history in June 2020 after the murder of George Floyd, a movement that took on insurrectionary proportions and sent the president himself hiding underground in a bunker under the White House. It really should be the end of the question of whether revolution is possible in this era, in this country. Is it possible for tens of millions of people to pour into the streets of every city from coast to coast? Is it possible for them to defy curfew orders in 200 cities to confront tear gas, rubber bullets, and mass arrests? Is it possible for mass demonstrations in the US to escalate even when National Guards are deployed in 30 states? These events, history has answered these questions two years ago. Protesters burnt down the Minneapolis police precinct an open act of insurrection, and 54% of the population saw that as a justified act, according to the polls in the following weeks. At its height, the mass movement had the approval of 78% of the population who said that the anger that led to the protests was justified, way more than the 26 million people who actually poured into the streets. So if an ups up uprising on that scale is possible in the 2020s, it's a, the, the debate is over. Revolution is possible. It is a fact. Those events very easily could have escalated into something much bigger, by the way, than what actually played out in June 2020. Trump was threatening to invoke the Insurrection Act of 1807. He had ordered army bases across the country to be ready to deploy within four hours to police demonstrations within US borders. And it, it provoked a whole crisis. Dozens of military officials, Pentagon officials, generals, and retired generals openly defying the US president because they realized you play that card, you play the send in the troops card, and you're out of cards. We came very close to a situation like that in this country. Does that sound like a ruling class that has this thing under control? 
a ruling class that has internal cohesiveness and political stability, as Jacobin says. To this day, you have, I mean, one of these, one of the pillars of, of bourgeois traditional rule in this country is a party in the grips of Trump that talks about uh, casting doubt on the legitimacy of, of US, a bourgeois democracy itself. They don't have a grip on this thing. It's time for the left to recognize these facts and to say, we're, we need to stop acting like we're in a post-revolution era. This is a revolutionary era. We're living in one right now. We need to stop acting as if we're headed for another period of calm and peace, like the post-war boom. And really, most of society understands that we're headed for a crisis. If you look at polls, most people think we're headed for chaos, for turbulence. For young people in particular, they try to look at their future, and what you see is a world on fire. We're, we're headed for a climate catastrophe. And if, and if you look at these polls, we're also headed for a major fight against these events, or a fight against capitalism. This mood in society, it's not just a fleeting temporary phenomenon. It's not something that's just going to pass. It's a growing desperation. It's a search for a way out of an impasse. And when millions of people start to question the structure of society, that's a big deal. That's an indication that something fundamental is changing, something profound in the foundation of society. If you want to understand that, you need Marxist ideas. You need Marxist theory. You know, Marxism for us, it's not just a, a method of analysis. It's not just a philosophy of class struggle. It's, we, we need these ideas to make sense of the world in the 2020s. The manifesto of 1848 sheds more light on the world of the 2020s than it did in the decade when it was written. The history of all hitherto existing society, history of class struggles. What does that mean? It means societies, class societies, they're not eternal. Capitalism is not eternal. It's not going to be around forever. Marx explained that class societies, like everything else in nature, they have a life cycle. They're born. A social system is born. It develops up to a certain point. It reaches a peak. It enters a phase of decline, just like a human life, just like anything else in nature. And eventually, it comes to an end. And that's what's happening with capitalism. It's lived long beyond its limits. The question for us is, what determines that lifespan? What is it about capitalism that we can say it's, it's lived past its limits, it's reached that impasse? Marxism explains that a social system can be viable, it can move forward, it can develop as long as it's developing the productive forces. That is the key to, to progress. That is the key to, to all the threat of human progress is the development of the productive forces, the ability of humans to meet their needs. When we have an improvement in that ability, an improvement in technology, in technique, scientific knowledge, social organization, productivity, that makes it objectively possible for more people to live without starving, for more people to have housing, to have their basic needs met, and for humanity to spend less years and hours of their life working just to make that survival possible. When you improve that, society moves forward. That's the, 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 the threat of progress that we've seen over the last 6,000 years of class society. And what makes a particular society enter an impasse is when, and go into a decline, is when it stops developing those productive forces. Instead of helping them move forward, it starts to constrain them. It becomes a straitjacket. It keeps the productive forces from moving forward. And when that becomes a historic fact, it expresses itself in countless ways as a general sense of decline. It becomes a historic crisis on all levels because the realization starts to sink in that life is getting worse. It's not getting better from one generation to the next. That realization is a powerful one, comrades. The widespread mood of discontent, it starts to grip mass consciousness, and that's the background for a revolutionary situation. It doesn't automatically mean the beginning of a revolution, but it marks the start of a revolutionary era, which we are definitely knee deep in. And this process has run its course under capitalism. I wanna try and explain how capitalism exhausted its progressive phase. In the manifesto, Marx and Engels, you know, they give their, the devil his due. They talk about the rise of the bourgeoisie and what it achieved. They say, the bourgeoisie historically has played a most revolutionary part. During its rule of scarcely 100 years, it has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations put together. You know, and it wasn't a pretty process. They acknowledge that as well. It was the most vicious, bloody, brutal exploitation and oppression humanity has ever seen. But this drive for profits, drive for growing markets, that provided an impetus in society that had never existed before. It's the single-minded logic of the system. It has that one purpose, accumulate capital. All human activity has been organized around that one purpose for the last 200 years. 
And for a while, it had a progressive byproduct because as a result of that drive, that motor force kept running, humanity started to harness the forces of nature like never before. All the masses, the, the major advances we've had in natural science, in the application of chemistry, the explosive development of industry, machinery, the mechanization of agriculture, steam power, electricity, railroads, transport, air travel, these developments are the basic justification for the rise of, of capitalism, but that mechanism, that motor force, it had its limits. There's only so far it can bring society forward before it turns into its opposite and it becomes an obstacle for society. For one, you know, competition in the market leads to concentration of capital. This is something that Lenin explained. You know, he didn't call it the, the late stage capitalism, he called it the highest phase of capitalism, imperialism. And it's the result, you know, after so much competition, larger and larger sums of capital are required even to compete, even to participate in the market until you reach a point where every industry is completely dominated by a handful of monopolies. And that's one factor that signals the end of capitalism's progressive phase. Because when you have a national market that is totally maxed out, it's dominated by, there, there's no more room, there's no more land out there to take over, there's no more markets to expand into, and you have it carved up by a handful of monopolies intertwined with finance capital, with the power of the banks, the only other place to expand is into other markets. You have this pressure start to rise and it becomes irresistible to seize other markets, to invade other countries. Imperialist powers start to seize, to, to try and exploit their resources, their labor forces. You have this muscling around to try and establish more of a, a sphere of influence. And we see this, this is the drive behind imperialist wars. The war that we're seeing in, in Ukraine, the, the proxy war between US imperialism in the form of NATO and Russia, it's also a question of th this expansion over the last 30 years, the encroachment of NATO to surround uh, Russia. But what we saw in Lenin's time was the fact that this driving force, it actually, it's, it's the driving force that led to the two world wars that we saw you know, capitalist nations carving up the world into a new arrangement at the cost of 40 million lives in the First World War, another 75 million in the second. As we heard, 27 million of those were, were uh, sacrificed by the Soviet Union. That was history's way of announcing that capitalism has reached the end of its progressive phase. Now, we have the historic fact of the post-war boom, and I think it's something very important that we understand. That period, from the end of World War II until the early 1970s, was an extremely exceptional period in the life of capitalism. A number of historically unique factors aligned to give world, the, the world market, and US capitalism in particular, a new lease on life. Some of those factors are, first of all, the wartime destruction of Europe, the fact that it wiped out the industry of all of America's capitalist rivals, massive state expenditure on armaments, which was the main force that brought the US economy out of the Great Depression, unprecedented state intervention. You know, when it's life and death questions of war, they don't leave it to the market to compete and figure out how the economy is gonna take care of its needs. They have wide scale nationalizations. The US government took over railroads, mines, armaments, other basic industries. And you know what? The US indus industrial machinery doubled over the course of World War II in the US. All of it was paid for by the US government. We don't hear much about that. New markets and technologies obviously came out of the, uh, the war effort as well because it wasn't just the, the weapons. You had new chemicals and plastics and other industries that could develop. And they need to rebuild Europe after the war. I mean, that was decades of, of rebuilding that created a, a massive new market. Those were the factors and that, that gave rise to this, this block of time all the way up to the 70s where it seemed like things were actually restabilizing. It seems, seems like things were getting better. But that came to an end in the 1970s and by every measure, Conditions in society have been in a steady decline since then. You know, sometimes they talk about this like neoliberalism, like it's a set of anti-worker policies. It's not a policy decision. It's the return of capitalism to its normal course after an abnormal period that, that basically saw, uh, uh, you know, this, this uh, exceptional anomaly, this, this upswing of capitalism. But if we analyze what's happened over the past 50 years, what we're talking about is, again, the return to this course of the historic impasse of capitalism that has no solution. I talked about Lenin's uh, you know, imperialism and talking about the, the monopolization, the concentration of capital. This has reached levels that would have been unimaginable in Lenin's time. The revenue of the Fortune 500 companies in the US represents 70% of GDP, a record $16.1 trillion. The top four banks have 68% 
of total banking of total banking assets in this country. The top eight banks have eleven and a half trillion dollars in assets. That's half half of the country's GDP. Eighty percent of mobile telecommunications is in the hands of just three companies. Just three companies control ninety five percent of credit cards. Four companies control eighty nine percent of baby formula. We saw what that led to not too long ago. Four companies control eighty five percent of corn seed. Four companies control 85% of the steer slaughtered in the US, 66% of pork, half the chicken. This is every industry. Three, four, five companies control every corner of every basic industry. That is what the economy has become. And it's not just concentration of capital that's the problem. It's not that it makes it harder to compete for other capitalists to get into the market. That's not, it's the basic forward mechanism of the productive forces. It's no longer moving forward. That is the problem. Marx explained that one of the fundamental contradictions of capitalism is the, the inability to escape increasingly disastrous crises of overproduction. And it's a contradiction that stems from the fact that workers produce everything in society, the goods and services that are sold on the market. The value that workers receive back in the form of wages is just a fraction of the value that they're producing. And so the difference is surplus value. And that's the profit of the capitalist. So far, so good for the capitalist. But there's a problem because it means that the working class as a whole can never buy back the full value of what they're collectively producing. And it means that inevitably, the market reaches a point where more is being produced than what the capitalists can actually sell for a profit. It starts to end up sitting on the shelves. And when they reach that point, they're starting to lose money. They have to respond. They lay off their part of their workforce. They scale back production. But in 10, you have more workers laid off, also spending less. That, that reduces consumption further. More products are unsold. More capitalists curve production and lay off their workers. You have this downward spiral. That is the basic fundamental source of recurring slumps. And there's no way of escaping that under capitalism. Marx explained, he talks about this in the manifesto, that the conditions of bourgeois society are too narrow to comprise the wealth created by them. And how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? by paving the way for more extensive, more destructive crises, and by diminishing the means whereby the crises are prevented. So one of these methods that they've used, and they've used it systematically and in an unprecedented scale, is the massive expansion of debt and credit to try and artificially expand the limits of the market. And this is something they've done ever since the end of the boom. The US was the largest, the world's largest creditor in the post-war boom, and now it's the world's largest debtor surpassing, it's reached a public debt of $30 trillion, surpassing the combined debt of the next three top indebted countries combined. Um, in the 1970s, debt was just a third, represented just a third of GDP. It's nearly 130% of GDP today. And it's not just the, the public debt, it's not just the government debt that, that they've used, it's the massive expansion of credit. It's debt at all levels, households, corporations, the total market credit was 1.5 trillion in the early 1970s. By 2008, it grew to over 50 trillion dollars. That's part of what created that degree of instability, that degree of devastation in the 2008 crisis, from 1.5 trillion to 50 trillion. Since then, it's grown to over 91 trillion dollars today. That's the degree of uh, attempting to artificially expand the natural limits of the system. So, you know, this basic feature. Of, of capitalism at earlier phases, the, the basic progressive feature was that the, the, the companies would take a portion of their profits and invest it back into production. That drive, that was the basic, the good thing about capitalism. And that's basically come to a halt. It's come to a complete stop over the last half century because of this chronic state of overcapacity. If the, if the market can absorb the products, there's no real drive to actually become more productive. And so as a result, industry across the board has been utilizing less than 80% of industrial capacity for most of the past two decades. By contrast, in the 60s and 70s, they would frequently get above 85%, sometimes 90%. In the last two crises, it's actually fallen below 65%. That means somewhere between 20, 35% of industry is always just sitting there idle. It's not being used. And from a business perspective, the capitalists would say, well, why should we invest in expanding production or improving productivity when we're already more productive than we need to be. We have more productive capacity than the market can actually even uh, uh, make use of. And that is a fact. As a result, the level of investment in production, it's been steadily declining since the 1970s. In each of the last, since the end of the post-war boom, we've had six recessions. 
Each time the capitalists have cut back their spending that they're investing on production, and it's never once gone to pre-recession levels afterwards. They cut it, they cut it, they cut it, and that's what's been happening for the past 50 years. At the height of the post-war boom, productivity was growing over the course of a decade, somewhere like 25, 35% in 10 years. It would become, the industry would become more productive. In the decade after 08, it grew by just 8.7%, less than a third of that rate. In the last few years, productivity growth has slowed to almost nothing. Economists are starting to talk about a global productivity slump. And in the last two quarters uh, of the, uh, in the US, producti productivity actually suffered its worst contraction since records began in 1947. That's the last two quarters of 2022. We're not talking about the pandemic in 2020. That's where the US economy is at today. So instead of taking a portion of their wealth and reinvesting it into something that's beneficial for the rest of society, what are the capitalists doing with their record profits? Well, for the past few decades, there's been a huge accumulation of corporate cash hoarding speculation. It's sitting there. It's not really being used for anything. For example, in the year 2000, corporations had $1.6 trillion in cash on hand. By the beginning of 2020, that was up to $4 trillion. Today, two years later, it's gone from $4 trillion to $5.8 trillion, a mountain of cash that is just sitting in bank accounts. It's not being invested in any form. There's also the rising trend of stock buybacks. You have companies that will use their revenue to purchase their own stocks in order to just drive up the cost of shares and use it as a way of enriching their shareholders. So in the decade, here's one example. In the decade before 2020, the top five airlines, which control 80% of domestic flights, spent 96% of their free cash flow on stock buybacks and delivered huge payouts to their owners. American Airlines alone spent $15 billion in six years just on stock buybacks. And when the pandemic hit, they claimed bankruptcy and they said, we need a bailout for the survival of the industry. That was the, the words of CEO of American Airlines who makes $12 million a year. He says, we need this to save the industry. And they, got, they received a $54 billion bailout after 96% of their free cash was used billions upon billions just to enrich their shareholders. This is what the impasse of capitalism represents. Instead of developing the productive forces, you have parasites, blatant parasitism, just taking as much wealth as possible and, and sucking it away from society and just accumulating it. The wealth, through these kinds of methods, the wealth of the top 1% increased by $6.5 trillion just last year. The stock portfolios of the top 1% are now worth $23 trillion. That's 100% of GDP. That doesn't mean the whole country is just in their hands, almost. Half of the stock market is, uh, is represented by the, the 1%, the, the stocks of just the 1%, because the stock market is actually at $46 trillion. Since 2010, the market value of the top 500 companies has tripled from $11 trillion to $32 trillion. So that's, that, that's the result. Has life gotten any better for the working class? over the, the course of accumulating these mountains uh, of wealth? Of course not. The capitalist crisis, you know, this, this recurring boom slump cycle, it's a part of capitalism since the beginning of the system. Even during the boom, you had booms and slumps, uh, even during the, the post-war period. But when the system enters a terminal phase of decline, that's an organic crisis of capitalism. We're talking about something broader because the booms are no longer developing life. It's no longer improving life. It's no longer perceived as a good time for the working class. And the slumps, they become increasingly catastrophic. They end up wiping out life savings, totally changing the course of lives for tens of millions of working class families. This is what we saw, for instance, in, in 2008, when 10 million people lost their homes and around 9 million people lost their jobs, and many of them haven't come back. During the boom, the, the post-war boom, the world economy was growing by 6% each year. The US economy had a huge share of that pie. Half of world GDP was represented by the United States economy. Today we have a totally different picture. The world economy has grown by just an average of 2.4% each year from 2008 to 2020. And the US share of world GDP has declined from one half to just 22%. So during the boom, frequently the US would have GDP growth each year of six, seven, sometimes 8%. Average GDP growth, between 2008 and 2020 was less than 1.3%. It's grinding to a halt. And the decline of this growth, the, the decline, you know, if you have, if the US represents a, sh a shrinking share of world GDP, 
and the system is no longer developing and it's no longer expanding and it's, there's no more new markets because it's all concentrated, what this means is a consistent fall, a 50-year fall in the, the standard of living for the working class. At the start of the uh, post-war era, one-third of the working class had union jobs in stable industries with wages that would just keep increasing. Today, one-third of the working class is earning $15 an hour or less. Participation in the labor force has declined steadily since the year 2000, and it's currently at its lowest level in 45 years. Manufacturing jobs have been in decline for 40 years. One-third of all manufacturing jobs were destroyed in the decade from 2000 to 2010. Um, you know, obviously, the, the many of the, the jobs the, that were lost in the, the 08 crisis, the, the kinds of jobs that are coming back are a much more lower paying jobs. Real wages have been stagnant for 15 years, sorry, for 50 years in the US, starting in the early 70s. And what this means is that the median income for a 25 year old worker with a high school diploma is $10,000 less than what it was for a worker in the same situation during the post war boom. And I think our generation is aware of that. I think what you're seeing is a response to that fact, which has a direct bearing on the way. I mean, it, it feeds into every other aspect of living standards. Even before the onset of this highest inflation in 40 years, which the ruling class has no way to control, everything they're trying to do to bring it under control is only creating more chaos and pushing the US economy and the world economy back into the brink of another catastrophic recession. Even before that, 112 million people struggled to cover healthcare costs. And now, I mean, the cost of living is making everything impossible. Half of the American workforce does not earn enough to rent a one-bedroom apartment. Half, uh, an all full-time minimum worker, a full-time minimum worker in this country can't afford to rent any apartment anywhere in the country, statistically speaking. Rents have risen 20% just since the start of 2020. In New York, they've risen 35%. Some, some, some cities, it's, it's even worse. And it's not just the inflation in general that we're seeing. This is also the result of capitalist speculation. At a time when there's less available housing for sale or for rent at any, than any time in the last 30 years, one in five houses sold in this country are being bought by investors who don't even move into them. The investors bought one third of all homes uh, for sale in, in Atlanta last year, tens of thousands of units, just like, and just like that, the housing prices climbed by 14% almost overnight. That's what the capitalist housing market offers. And we've seen similar situations in other major cities. Since the 2008 crisis, a lot of those homes that were foreclosed were bought up by private equity investors. And so you have now massive corporate landlords controlling huge portions of the housing market. Of course, this means we have a simpler task for the logistics of a planned economy because you simply nationalize those huge corporate landlords and you can have the beginning to, to boost off a, a democratic socialist um, housing plan, a voluntary plan of, of uh, socialist housing. So these are some of the factors that are fueling this deep-seated discontent. It's putting society on a collision course with capitalism. When we talk about the necessity of revolution, the historical justification for a revolution, these are the kinds of factors. It's the fact that capitalism is holding back the productive forces and it's making life impossible for the working class. You have decade after decade of decline. If a revolutionary situation is like the, the earthquake, the culmination of this pressure that builds between tectonic plates, these are all the factors that are increasing, they're exerting more and more pressure along this fault line. And it's not just this general gradual thing that happens, it's the experience of living through shocks, living through great events that wake people up. The experience of growing up during the 2008 crisis and its aftermath has completely shaped the outlook of what has become the largest generation, by the way, in US history. The millennial generation, it's also it's the largest in US history, it's the largest within the working class. Within three years, the millennials were gonna, are going to make up 75% of the global workforce. U.S. millennials are working an average of 45 hours a week. So this is what the working class has become, a generation that was shaped by the experience of nothing but capitalist stagnation and crisis. Along with Gen Z, millennials are the most racially diverse generation in U.S. history, the most conscious of questions of inequality and oppression. They're the most educated generation in U.S. history, as we've discussed. And yet millennial households, their incomes are 11% lower than Gen X and 14% lower than baby boomer households. So it's also the most class conscious generation of the working class since any time, at least since World War II. Most millennials identify as working class. They reject the middle class label because it's meaningless. We are the working class. The US 
because of all of these factors that have fueled that radicalization of this layer, which is now the majority of the working class, the US is headed for revolution because all of those factors are a response to the impasse of capitalism. They're not going away, they're going to intensify. It's not going to calm down and get better, it's going to go in the other direction. And it's, you know, it's the fact that capitalism has outlived its usefulness to humanity. There is no reversing that fact, there is no turning back that wheel. It's usually not a normal thing for human beings to question the structure of their civilization. You know, to, to question the, the mode of production. Most people go about their lives without giving a second thought to whether capitalism is the only thing, the best thing that's out there, or whether there's the possibility of some alternative, some way that we could organize human activity in a fundamentally different way. But because of the, the impasse of, of capitalism, this decline is starting to wake people up. There are now actually tens of millions of people who are thinking about precisely the impasse of capitalism. It takes time for something like that to normally register in the conscious thinking of, of tens of millions of people. And people don't just, re they don't just wake up and say, you know, I, 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 with a full-fledged Marxist perspective of what's happening in history and say, well, I feel like lately the, cap the, the productive forces have been held back and that we need a new mode of production and it's probably time for a, a revolution. What it actually looks like is these polls, recent polls that say 85% of Americans believe the country is on the wrong track. 87%, that's nine in 10, say they're dissatisfied with the way things are going. 71% of Americans feel angry about the state of the country. 82% of Americans feel that wealthy people in large corporations have too much power and influence in today's economy. When you have these kinds of moods intensifying, that's the kind of fuel that can give rise to a revolutionary situation. And you have the rise of a generation that's been shaped by precisely the kinds of historic conditions that give rise to a, a revolutionary outlook. You have this, not just the class consciousness, not just the, the discontent that ends up reaching a boiling point, it's this iron will to do something about it because what are you gonna do with this life? If you're faced with these kinds of prospects, what are you gonna do with this life? Except for dedicate it to the fight to overthrow this system. There's a lot, of, that's, that's a force that is becoming a, a shaping psychological factor for millions of young people. And the liberals, you know, they can't understand this and they complain that too many people are getting obsessed with the politics of grievance and two peop people are too negative and they're too angry and it's probably caused by social media. Actually, that's the, the fact, this anger in society is actually the, the, the explanation for the rise of polarization, for the rise of Trumpism, this, this phenomenon we'll discuss more tomorrow, but this, this collapse of the liberal center ground in politics, as, as a comrade said today, this growing hatred of the establishment, the suspicion toward all media and other institutions but Trumpism is also going to have its rise and its fall because it offers no solution to the working class. It doesn't offer a response to the impasse of capitalism, these underlying historic factors that are driving this decline, this relentless decline in, in living standards. For, there's no solution to that. What, it, what Trumpism really represents, it's not just a section of the working class, by the way. It's, all, it's a middle class phenomenon primarily. But you have a middle class that's vacillating, that's starting to lose confidence in the traditional status quo. That vacillation can go to the right. It can also go in another direction. You know, Lenin talked about the conditions for the rise of a revolutionary situation. The ruling class being unable to control society in the old way, being un unable to rule in the old way. They start to have crises. They start to split. They start to have disagreements with different wings about how to proceed, how to move forward. Crises of institutions, crises of confidence. We absolutely see that in, in uh, a total collapse of the legitimacy of the Supreme Court today. You're gonna to see that with every, every single institution. It's already underway, shattering illusions that bourgeois democracy has any real meaning for the, for the working class. But the middle class vacillation is, is a part of a revolutionary situation. You have this polarization, and ultimately it, it ends up bringing the middle class to a position, the, the petty bourgeoisie, the, the people who have some stake in the system, but they're being crushed, they're being ruined, to say, Capitalism doesn't really offer me the security that I need. It doesn't offer me a future. If there's another force moving forward, the other condition is you need the working class to be ready to move, to have that discontent fueling, not just building up and accumulating, but igniting and being in a place where millions of working people are ready to take matters into their own hands. As we've seen in tw since 2019, in country after country, that point has been reached you know, over and over again. Of course, the, the, the final condition that uh, this famous Lenin's four conditions for a revolutionary situation is that you have to have a revolutionary leadership present that can connect with that in that moment where the, the upsurge is actually ignited, that can 
connect with it, put forward a program for revolution, for what it actually means to transfer power from the capitalist to the, to the working class. So we see that you know, conditions determine consciousness. It's a basic idea of, of Marxism. But consciousness isn't determined in a mechanical, direct way. It happens dialectically. You have this long, gradual accumulation of experience, this accumulation of disappointments with what life under capitalism represents, coupled with dramatic shocks, coupled with those moments that they call them once-in-a-lifetime crises, but they keep happening over and over, and it keeps impacting consciousness, and it changes the way that people think about the system. Going back to this idea of the old left and what happened in the 30s, the radical, you know, the, this idea, you know, we have meetings of the Communist Party filling Madison Square Garden with 21,000, uh, you know, communists with sim symbols like this. And now the people at Jacobin treat it like we're uh, on this, uh, on the fringes of society and, the, you know, we can't let go of these dreams. Well, what was it? about conditions, what was it about the historic environment that led millions of people to draw revolutionary conclusions, not just that, but to get involved? What was it that pushed all of those young people to become cadres of mass Marxist organizations, of socialist parties, communist parties, to the point where they were a major factor in US politics? It wasn't you know, maybe the, the, the mass revolutionary party that could have taken power at, at the moment, but they were a major factor. What was it that pushed them? It's precisely experiences like the Great Depression, like world wars. These kinds of, and I mean, we don't have to search very far for the kinds of experiences that are radicalizing the young generation, the 2008 crisis, and what it meant to grow up in the aftermath of that. And now you have the 2020, and you have you know, this, this period that we've entered. We can only imagine what events are gonna be added to this list. And I think that the, the point is, we actually live in a period where we're going to have even greater crises on the horizon than anything like the Great Depression, even greater than the, the world wars. I mean, if you look at the rising tensions between US and China, and what this conflict between the two greatest imperialist powers on the face of the planet represents, that's 40% of the world economy represented by two countries. And they're, in a typical imperialist fashion, muscling their way to domination of greater and greater parts of the world. Now, there's no question, the US imperialism dominates the world economy still, but it doesn't dominate it like it used to 20 years ago. It's, it's, it's going through a relative decline in its domination. The problem is, while the US share of world GDP has fallen from 50% to 22%, China's share has increased from 1% to 15%. So you have, it's no longer a, a situation where you have one imperialist power and a certain stability comes from the fact that that's the one world policeman. It's no longer so stable. It's a new alignment of what's happening in the, the balance of forces in the world power. China is the world's number one lender with more outstanding loans than the IMF, the world banks, all OECD go uh, creditor governments combined. It has the world's largest navy. It has double the number of active troops as the United States. Now, you know, so far US imperialism has refused to even call the no-fly zone in Ukraine. They don't want to send boots on the ground. They're not in a position, you know, I mean, this, this relative decline in the strength of US imperialism is a historical fact. And even so, you have, you know, if something were to erupt over Taiwan in the coming years, you may still have a situation where both countries are willing to avoid an open, direct warfare because of the nuclear threat, which neither ruling class has an interest in. They, they want to dominate the world economy. They don't want to be completely wiped off the map. So you, you, you might, that may still be a fact that you, you have both countries willing to avoid this. But even full-scale sanctions, a full-scale economic war, a blockade between the two largest economies in the world that represent 40% of world GDP, that would be a devastating event far greater than the Great Depression. It would affect every country on the face of this planet because those economies are intertwined with every economy in, in the world. I mean, the, the dislocation that we're seeing now in Europe because of the, the war in Ukraine, the fact that you have skyrocketing inflation, the, the, the fall of Liz Truss is uh, one of the, the, the results of that. But you have 80% increase in utility bills for people in Britain. You have households in Germany, the powerhouse of Europe, collecting firewood so that they don't freeze over the, the winter. That's, that's, a, that, that's nothing compared to the kind of dislocation and economic chaos that we would have if you had a full-scale uh, confrontation between the US and China. 
The workers of China have no interest in that. The workers of the United States have no interest in that. Of course, the workers of Taiwan, of no country on the, on the planet, have the interest in that kind of a scenario. And yet that's the direction that the ruling class is driving society. That's the kind of thing that can provoke an unprecedented crisis, a crisis of the regime, a crisis of the legitimacy of the entire US government. It can provoke an uprising in, uh, in China. We're seeing that there's a crisis there as well that's, that's brewing. There's a lot of discontent that's, being, that's accumulating. And it can provoke a revolutionary response by the masses in the United States. That's just one example of what are these factors that can be the boiling point. There's an even greater threat than that, I would say. Marx explains that the capitalists, you know, in the manifesto, he says the capitalists unleashed something that they, they couldn't manage. Modern bourgeois society is like the sorcerer who is no longer able, able to control the spells, to, sorry, to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. It's, it's a, one of these quotes that make you think of like Fantasia or something, you know, calling up these spells from the, the, the ruling class brought this into being, but it's something that goes beyond its control. And I think this describes the climate crisis. The dire warnings of the IPC, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you know, this, this is something that I think tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people have read these things and it impacts people. You read these reports, they're coming out regularly. Um, and it's nothing new. I think we have to understand that governments have known for decades. The fossil fuel industry knew full well what was happening. These warnings have been issued for 40 years. The IPCC was organized 40 years ago. Fossil fuels have been burning, of course, since the Industrial Revolution. But of all the atmospheric carbon that has been emitted since pre-industrial times, half of it was emitted in the last 30 years. The capitalists knew what they were doing. In effect, the response of the ruling class was to say, we could pull the emergency brake, but it would mean a major loss of some really profitable markets. So instead, we're going to send our species hurtling toward an existential catastrophe. That's the response that the ruling class has given. And this is a crisis of their making. If that were the only factor, that alone guarantees that society is on a collision course with the profit motive, with capitalism. That alone guarantees the inevitability of revolutionary uprisings and events in response to this fundamental contradiction. Because the realization is dawning on millions of young people that the capitalist system itself is responsible for threatening humanity's chances of survival on this planet. It's not government inaction. It's not lack of information. It's the inability of the capitalist system to respond, to cope to this existential threat of its own creation. And the socialist revolution is the only solution to that. That's a message that's a fact, it's a historic fact, and it's going to continue to become more and more conscious in the minds of, of this generation of the working class. Despite these kinds of scenarios, there is an inherent revolutionary optimism in a Marxist understanding of human history because the picture before us, it's not just one of crises and catastrophes. It's a picture of a system that's expressing its historical exhaustion. It's run its course, it deserves to be overthrown. That's the historical fact that's being expressed in all of these crises that we see. But Marx explained that the system also creates its own grave diggers. The very conditions of capitalist impasse have given rise to this new generation of the working class that has everything going for it to be the social force that can carry out the historic mission of our class. To the extent that we understand that, comrades, we are duty bound by history. We have a duty to humanity, to our class, to do everything in our power to achieve the socialist revolution in our lifetime by building the forces of Marxism into a powerful enough force to bring that revolution to victory.